September 7. We started on again and came four miles through prairie land to Sherman, which is quite a nice little town, the county seat of Grayson County. There seems to be a great deal of business going on here, and Frank bought two yards of calico at 17 cents a yard. We left the town after remaining an hour and came on four miles over tolerable good roads to a mill. Here, Mr. Kirkland bought corn at 50 cents a bushel. We then came one mile over very rough hilly roads to a little creek with very steep banks. This is the last entry of Ruth Shackelford's 1868 diary that was published. During this day, the Shackelfords were in the indigenous territories of the Kickapoo, the Tawakoni, and the Wichita. I'm Jen Globius, and this is the Hellenaki Deep Dive, a podcast about the process of mapping and analysis for historical and archaeological research using open source tools. In this episode, I'll discuss the end of Ruth Shackelford's 1868 diary and what came after that, including their probable route back to Missouri. And then I'll also go into some of the many, many questions I still have about the Shacklefords and their travels in 1865 and 1868. Let's dive in. And just before we get started, uh, the next episode will be in three weeks instead of two. So it'll be released on July 22nd because I am working on an archaeological project out of the country for a few weeks. And so I will get this episode out when I get back. Thanks. So where we pick up this very last entry of that we have of Ruth Shackelford's 1868 diary, the Shackelfords have rejoined the Butterfield Overland Mail Route. So they had left it to actually make it to Center Mills, Texas, where they had stayed for five weeks. And at this point, they've cut across and they have rejoined the route after going through Dallas. And this is at Sherman, which is near the border. It's n- near the, the northern boundary of Texas to the Red River, which separates Texas from the state of Oklahoma, which at, in 1868 was still known as Indian Territories. So they were rejoining the, the Butterfield Overland Mail Route. And by 1868, a stage service had actually reestablished along that same route, at least going between Texas and Fort Smith, Arkansas, so going through the Indian Territories. So it's very probable that the Shacklefords were following that route as as they went back to Missouri. So they would have crossed the Red River using Colbert Ferry, which was across from Sherman. We have a recollection from John Malcolm, who was a ferryman on for the ferry in the 1870s. I'll include a link to this article that includes his his recollections in the show notes. But by the time he he reached the ferry in like 1870, 1871, the ferry had a chute for cattle, basically between a fence that had been erected and a large rock on the Texas side so that they could herd cattle easily through the chute across the Red River at the ferry. And we know that in 1871, the toll at Colbert's Ferry was as follows. So for a two-horse wagon, it would cost $1. For a four-horse wagon, it was $1.25. For a six-horse wagon, the cost was $1.5. It would be $0.25 for a man and horse, and then 10 cents per head for any loose cattle or horses. So not inexpensive to cross. There was another ferry uh, nearby as well, but this Colbert's Ferry was the one that was on the, that was used by the Overland Trail, by the stage route. So it's probably the one that the Shackelfords took. From there, the, the Butterfield route cut across the southeastern corner of Oklahoma, of Indian Territories, to go to Fort Smith, Arkansas. So they would have headed north and come to Boggy Depot, which was one mile west of the Clear Boggy River. Location, a town that had large houses and cottages, a hotel, bakery, apothecary, all sorts of other businesses as well and a town that during the Civil War had Confederate soldiers stationed there. I mean, they stationed there long term. They had log cabins that had built for them to live in, and they had a cannon to defend it. 
And keeping in mind that the tribes, the, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw, who were moved to Indian territories, came from the southeastern United States. At least some of the Choctaw and the Chickasaw were slave owners as well. And so they had sympathies with the Confederates. The Shacklefords would have probably passed through Boggy Depot, so this place that had housed Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. And they would have headed even further north to Scullyville, which had been founded in 1832 during the removal of the Choctaws from their homelands. Scullyville was the place where payments and distributions were made to the Choctaw. After the Civil War, Scullyville declined, where many residences and stores were burned and destroyed in some other way, and they were never rebuilt again. I wonder what the state of Scullyville would have been in 1868, so just a couple years after the Civil War when the Shacklefords moved through. Like, had it already been burned during battle? I, my resource, which was um, an article by Morrison called The Sa- the Saga of Scullyville, the ar- article doesn't say anything about when exactly Scullyville declined, just that it was after the Civil War. So after Scullyville, the path would have turned more towards the east, and they would have had to cross the Arkansas River to reach Fort Smith, Arkansas. And from there, they would have traveled north through Fayetteville. And during the very early days of the Butterfield Overland Stage Route, during part of this this route between southern Missouri and northern Arkansas, the horses on the stage would be replaced with mules so that they could actually make it through the hills. So the route from Fayetteville, Arkansas, continued north into Missouri to Springfield, Missouri, and would have continued north even more. The route in 1858 left from Tipton, Missouri, which was the, the the end of the Pacific Railroad at that point in Missouri. So the mail would have come from St. Louis to Tipton by railroad and then taken on the stage. And I just want to mention this, not because the Shacklefords actually went there, but in 1858, the very first stop of the Butterfield Overland stage was at a George Shackleford, so a place called Shackleford but spelled L-E and not E-L, the Shackleford. And this was in Syracuse in Morgan County, Missouri. And I don't think he was any relation, but I just, I found this information months ago and I just want to share it, that there was a Shackleford stop on the Butterfield Overland Trail. But our Shacklefords, Ruth and Frank and their family, did not go that far, or at least I don't think they went that far. Because they end up settling in St. Clair County, which was just west of the route, north of Springfield, but not all the way back to, like, Tipton. And this is interesting. The Shacklefords did not return to any place they had lived before in Missouri. So Frank and Ruth had previously lived in Boone County. That's where Ruth had been born, which is in the center of the state. After they were married, they lived in Shelby County in Shelbyville, which was in the northeastern part. And when Ruth's 1865 diary begins, they're taking off from Clark County, Missouri, which was in the very northeastern part of Missouri. And that's where the Gatewoods had been living. So they don't move back to any of those places where they lived before, where they had family. Frank's brother was still living in Shelby County, Missouri. Instead, they move to more of the southwestern corner to St. Clair County. And their family at this point, in 1868 when they settle, is made up of Frank, who is then 33 years old, Ruth, who was 35, their oldest Sarah was 12, Margie, who I'm descended from, was 11 at that point, Rebecca was 9, Franklin, who Ruth called Little Frankie at the very beginning of the 1865 diary, So Frank was, little Frankie was now seven. Mary, who had been a baby on the 1865 journey, was five. And then they had a little baby, Ada, who was born in California, who was like one or two. So this family settled themselves in in St. Clair County with the Kirklands. On the 17th of April in 1870, Ruth gave birth to twin boys. 
named Charles Kirkland Shackelford, so named after middle name after their friends the Kirklands, and Samuel Galloway Shackelford. The Galloway Galloway was Ruth's maiden name. Samuel Galloway Shackelford died that same day. He was a twin, did not survive. And then from the May 20th, 1870, the Columbia Statesman newspaper from Columbia, Missouri, under the headline, died. At Roscoe, Missouri, May 5th, 1870, Ruth Shackelford, age 37, wife of W.F. Shackelford. Mrs. Shackelford was born in Boone County, Missouri, July 31st, 1833, the daughter of Samuel and Rebecca Galloway, early settlers of Boone County. In the year 1852, she made profession of religion and became a member of the O.S. Presbyterian Church. She was married to W.F. Shackelford, October 24th, 1854, and in the year 1857, she united with the Baptist Church, of which she lived a consistent member until the day of her death, which occurred on the 5th of May, 1870. I found Ruth's obituary months ago when I was working on her 1865 diary, and it struck me very hard, and it still stru- still strikes me really hard since... It, it, I had to take a couple of days. I didn't work on anything Shackelford related. I was just like stunned that Ruth had made it through their travels in 1865, where so many of the Gatewoods like pass on her sister in law and her nieces. And she made it through that and through the deserts and everything coming back in 1868. And like so many women at that time, she gave birth and did not survive long after that. And I don't know if it's related, but chances are it was complications from childbirth, which is very common. But I just find it very tragic that two years later, after surviving traveling halfway across the country and then back through really difficult circumstances and she she dies. So Frank is left to raise the kids. He remarries in 1873 to Nancy Wilhote, with whom he has a bunch of other children. And I think it's through one of those children that Ruth Shackelford's diary actually eventually gets passed down to the editor of the Covered Wagon Women series, and that's where it comes from. Frank himself, if you remember, he was always going to any preaching that was going on nearby when they were traveling. He himself became a minister of the Coon Creek Baptist Church, and he stayed in St. Clair, Missouri for the rest of his life. And with that, that is the end of Ruth Shackelford's 1868 diary, and a little bit afterwards and the end of Ruth Shackelford's life itself. But I still have so many ongoing questions about the Shackelfords. So going through their travels so far, I still have so many questions. Like number one, why did the Shackelfords leave Missouri in 1865? And why then? Why 1865? They left in early May, so they might not have actually known about Lee's surrender yet, and not all the Confederate forces had actually surrendered at that point. But why leave in 1865? One of my next big questions is, why did they go to San Bernardino, California? They were headed to Los Angeles, and they end up stopping shortly before that in San Bernardino. Why go to Southern California? What was it that made them go there? And... Did that affect their route? Like, is that why they went through Salt Lake City and then went southwards instead of taking a cutoff? I'm not sure, but I suspect. And then why did they only stay for a little over two years in California? Why did they leave California in 1868 and go back to Missouri? There are instances of many of men who would go to California during the gold rush and come back. 
or would then come back and get their families. But I don't know how many families would like get to California, stay there for a couple years, and then head back to where they lived. They had completely up uprooted themselves. And it's like, why? This wasn't these were expensive undertakings. These trips were not cheap. I mean, they wouldn't have had to buy the wagon again for their second trip, but still, it took a lot to actually go this. And then one of my other questions is why, when they get back to Missouri, do they settle in St. Clair County, someplace where they didn't have any family, where they hadn't lived before? And I might not never find definite answers to any of these questions, but I'm doing research into different parts of this. So I think we can understand my these questions and possible answers if we have more context about them. So I'm doing research on the families, the, the Shacklefords, the Gatewoods, the Kirklands, because understanding their family situations might help us understand their thinking of the Shacklefords and the Gatewoods, why they made this travel and came back. I'm also doing re- research on this era in Missouri and California and in Texas. So trying to build up a better understanding of this area. So there will be more episodes about the Shacklefords as I start to put this together and I'll share what I find or don't find. So we have come to the end of Ruth's 1868 diary, but not the end of my journey with Ruth Shackelford's diaries. And I just want to remind you that the next episode of the Helenaki Deep Dive will be in three weeks, so released on July 22nd. Thanks for listening. Email questions or comments to deepdive at helenaki.com or ask them on the Helenaki Deep Dive Facebook page. Show notes with links to resources mentioned in this episode are available at helenaki.com. That's H-E-L-O-N-A-K-I dot com. You can also find ways to support the show, now including merch, such as t-shirts, mugs, and stickers with the Helenaki Deep Dive logo at helenaki.com slash support. My thanks to Patreon supporter at the geospatial analyst level, Leah Varel. Your support keeps the Helenaki Deep Dive going. The Helenaki Deep Dive is written and produced by me, Jen Globius of the Helenaki. The theme music is Deep Ocean Instrumental by Dan O of danosongs.com. Thanks for listening.